Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Tuesday, the 9th of April, 2013, and our special guest is Madeline Levine. Madeline, welcome. Thank you, Steve. So glad to have you here. There's so, so many fun connections with you. There's Denise Pope and Challenge Success, and then Vicky Abelis has been on the show, and uh -huh. you were featured in that film as well, right? Yes, I was. Yeah, delightful to have you here. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project, thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for this environment and their support. We've had so much fun this year with virtual conferences, much more to come. These are free worldwide events, very much based on peer-to-peer -peer teaching and learning. The School Leadership Summit was in March. All of those recordings are up and freely available at schoolleadershipsummit.com. Coming up at ISTE, we have our fringe conference activities starting with the All Day Unconference on Saturday, then this summer a Worldwide STEM conference, in the fall a Future of Libraries conference, and of course our five-day, 24-hour-day global education conference in November. Coming up on the Future of Education, uh, next week Matt Hearn on his de-schooling books. Uh, fascinating guy, lots of uh, interesting material. Uh, after that, Elliot Washer and Charles. Wojowski on Leaving to Learn. Uh, and Elliot's associated with Big Picture Schools. And we've had, um, we had Dennis Litke on before. This should be really interesting and well worth listening to. Jim Popham on Measurement and the Truth About Testing. John Hunter, uh, who's been on the show before. Uh, his book has just been published. And we're going to discuss his new book, which is on the same topic as we previously looked at, his, his fourth grade classroom world peace project, Peter Gray on Free to Learn, and lots more coming up. Anyway, I hope you'll join us for something. If you've missed any of the well, interviews, they are all recorded in full Blackboard Collaborate form as well as MP3. John Hattie, um, really fascinating talk with John from the University of Melbourne. Um, great uh, look at uh, meta studies, a meta study of meta studies uh, involving millions and millions of children and lots and lots of data. And, and one of the most intriguing and interesting ways to come to many of the same conclusions we'll talk about today. Michael Fullan, Yang Zhao, Adam Bessie, Jay Cross. Anyway, lots, lots of material there, hopefully something worth listening to. This is a chance for those of you in the studio audience to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map for a star icon. Click on that twice and click on the map. This is going to blow you away, but I'm in rural India at a school for children of leprosy affected parents with a really good internet connection. And it's 5.30 in the morning and uh, 5.40 at this point, and I'm really delighted to be with you and have everything going smoothly. Feel free to put a note in the chat. Let us know the time, the temperature. Yes, I actually went to a leper colony yesterday and helped uh, clean wounds and replace bandages, something I thought probably that had probably disappeared from the world um, and probably will at some point, but is still actually uh, an issue, not just a health issue, but a social issue. And of those of you who know I have vitiligo, the skin condition, it's often mistaken for leprosy, and that's been kind of part of my longer-term interests in this particular cause. OK, keep putting those notes in the chat, and we're going to move forward. Thanks to Mighty Bell for support as well. And I created a Mighty Bell space for this show. Let me get that link up for you. I thought I had it handy, and I don't. But I will in a second. Mighty Bell will allow you to continue the conversation. There are some resources from Madeline there, including a link to challenge success. And here you go. That link is in the chat, and it's also in my blog post. Oh, <laughs> wrong slide there. Hang on. So that's what you get for waking up at 3 in the morning to put your slides together. Now, Lynn, thanks so much for being here. What, what a lot of fun. My pleasure. <laughs> This is, this is, I, I've never seen anything. Any so setup. it's been really interesting to be here. Uh, go ahead. I was just saying, I'm blown away by the whole setup you have. Amazing to me. 
this really is a lot of fun. Uh, uh, those who participate um, will also appreciate sort of the worldwide aspect of this and the ways in which the technology is facilitating, I think, conversations of worth and value. Um, and again, uh, it's sort of intriguing that you have your webcam on. I appreciate that um, because it uh, gives us sort of a sense of mm -hmm. immediacy. Um, it's, it's really interesting for me to be here in India and to be at a school that's running in a very traditional way, uniforms, lots of discipline. Um, and they had a ceremony yesterday in which several of the kids got up and s sang the Gangnam style song from the North Korean mm -hmm. pop artist. And the kids kind of went wild. And the, there was a huge amount of energy. And then the teachers, you could see the teachers sort of quieting everybody down. There's sort of a bigger issue here worldwide in terms of how we think about childhood and how we think about discipline and obedience and schooling. And I know this book is directed at parenting, but we're going to end up talking about schooling. And you have right. a background as a teacher, right? Okay. And how has that informed your work? Um, I think teaching is the toughest job in the world, frankly. And um, so, one, I have tremendous respect for teachers. I don't like the way that they are being um, chastised sort of from all sides, whether it's about union stuff or parents calling it, you know, 11 o'clock at night to crab about a grade that their child got. Um, so, you know, just to be upfront, I'm a, I'm a sympathetic ex-teacher. Um, I, I think I, I taught in the South Bronx of New York. So now I work with very wealthy people, but I started out working with um, very deprived inner city kids. And while there are profound differences in needs between those two groups, there's also a lot of threads, I think, that are very similar. Um, and I'm, I'm interested, you know, we, we tend to, to bifurcate rich and kid, poor kids or, you know, smart kids and not so smart kids or talented kids and not so talented kids. And, you know, frankly, my experience both as a teacher and a child and adolescent psychologist is, one, yes, kids are profoundly different, but also that they're profoundly the same in terms of what they need to thrive, which is um, basically an acknowledgement of their uniqueness, not necessarily you're so special, which I think can be problematic, but certainly every kid is unique with unique talents. Um, and I think that we make a big mistake, certainly in this country, in, in um, sort of paying so much attention to a particular kind of learning and a particular kind of intelligence and really marginalizing so many other skills and talents that kids have. I think we lose an awful lot of kids. Um, wh whether it's inner city or, you know, Beverly Hills, because we like analytic kids and we marginalize creative and hands-on kids. And I, I have one of each, so um, I know sort of up close and personal how differentially the education system serves those different kinds of kids. There's a line in the book that's sort of stunning. You say, a generation of kids who resemble nothing so much as trauma victims. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, The Price of Privilege, your previous book, kind of shift your gears in terms of thinking about your own work and what you would focus on? Uh, you know, The Price of Privilege was supposed to be this little book. Um, uh, I don't think anybody expected it to be a New York Times bestseller, certainly not my publisher who ran, I don't know, 11,000 copies of it or something. Um, it, it, it really came out of, look, I've been a psychologist for almost 30 years. I felt like I knew my population really well. I live in Marin County. It's an affluent suburb of uh, San Francisco. And I was, there was no question to me that I was seeing a change in my population and a change that was much harder to identify. You know, when you're in psychology school, making the diagnosis, learning how to make the diagnosis of depression in teenagers is, is uh, not hard. You know, there's a list, right? Not interested in school and poor hygiene and all these kinds of things. But those weren't the kids I was seeing. The kids I was seeing actually were functioning reasonably well, and we just finished a study at Stanford that showed that kids who are um, 
kids who are actively suicidal, having active suicidal ideation, are having no de decrement in their grades, which is, you know, quite astounding. Uh, if you're that depressed, you would expect kids not to be doing as well. Um, but I think there's a whole generation of kids who have simply learned how to look really good in spite of whatever's going on with them, who have a highly cultivated surface and very few internal skills. And I thought I was just talking to those kids. Um, but, you know, the popularity of the book made it really clear that this kind of what the race to the top, which is an expression I don't like, there's not much room at the top, that this earlier and faster and better and more um, it is not serving any kids. It's disengaging them from learning and impairing mental health. That's, that's, in a nutshell, that's my take about what our current education system for the most part is doing to our students. I was on a panel at a conference at Google and talked about the idea that, that schools leave most kids feeling like failures. And right. then after the conference, a uh, number of students came up who identified themselves as students who had been successful in high school mm -hmm. and said, you know, it's not just the students who are, who, who are known to be failures or, or seen to be failures who feel that way, but we've never felt like we were really successful, even though we were able to check off all the boxes. Right. So that's part of this, right? Well, yeah, it's part of it. One, one of the lines that kids use all the time in the office here is, um, I'm only as good as my last performance, meaning that you're successful simply as long as you come home with an A. And, you know, the reality is none of us want to be judged solely on our performance. We want to be judged on our character and our connections and, you know, essentially our sense of self and who we are. And so, even if you get an A in this particular kind of culture, it, 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 does, it doesn't really do much because the next thing you may not get an A and, and then you don't get the kind of admiration. And for these kids, it's this co kind of constant infusion of external um, appreciation and admiration that keeps them going, uh, which is very problematic because they never learn to self-soothe, they never learn to feel better because they go inside and, I don't know, learn to meditate, you're in India, learn to meditate, learn to breathe, learn to um, self-soothe, learn to run around the blood. They don't learn any of those kind of basic coping skills. They're constantly looking for the outside to uh, justify them and they know that they're always at risk. And so you know Carol Dweck's right? You know this whole idea that if all of your um, of course, I, saw, I caught her name earlier. If all of your um, strokes come from outside, you're, you're much more vulnerable. You're much less likely to take risks, um, which ultimately means you perform um, poorer at a task than somebody who is just truly engaged and enjoys, you know, the work itself. I think one of the things that I sort of stunningly appreciated about the book was the parallel you draw between the lives adults live and their children's lives. And, and we'll go into kind of the modeling and the ability to, to, to actually have a healthy life yourself, but there's also this degree to which um, the parents' lives seem to reflect the same sort of shallowness and stresses that the children are having in their school lives. What's the connection? Well, what's the connection? You know, kids model, kids model and learn their their values and their way to be in the world um, from the people that they're closest to. So, I, you know, you said early, Steve, that um, we would be talking about children. And while it would seem that I write about kids, and I certainly do, you know, I really do think the issue is with adults, um, with our willingness to um, sort of forego values um, for this uh, superficial kind of accomplishment. I, I just spent the whole day seeing patients. And, you know, what I hear over and over again is this unbelievable level of anxiety about how kids are going to function in the world, which is, you know, always been 
the purview of parents. We want our kids to go out and function well in the world. But the misunderstanding about what functioning well in the world actually means, is it can be absolutely mind-blowing to me. And, and in surprising places, you know, I speak at a lot of progressive schools or at Friends or at Montessori, you know, schools that I really like and that get it, uh, at least theoretically, but the anxiety is still there. And so parent after parent will come up to me and say, you know, they just get too much homework, so is it a problem if I do my son's science homework every day? And it's like, Really, you just listen to me for an hour. You really have to still ask that question because, of course, it's a problem. It's a systemic problem. Why is the school giving so much homework that a kid can't function? Um, but a parent's willingness to sort of take over for their child um, and deprive them of the opportunity of um, learning how to mod moderate their own lives, learning how to talk to teachers, learning what matters, um, I am, frankly, somewhat stunned because where I live, and my kids are all in their 20s, when they were in junior high school and high school, they sprayed our local apples with a chemical with Alar, and every mom in town, every one of us was out at Safeway, you know, with picket signs saying, you know, no toxic apples for our children. We have so much evidence now that this particular paradigm of education is toxic. We have it in the incredibly high rates of disengagement. We have it in the incredibly high rates of depression and anxiety disorders and eating disorders and self-mutilation. It's kind of like, um, what are we waiting for? Um, it's not working. There are much better paradigms out there. And um, I, think, I think it's an act of courage, frankly, on the part of the parent to say, you know, to, to deal with the school, to deal with their child, to maybe swim against the culture of their community. Um, but that's what we've always done. That's our job is to be protected. We immunize our children, right, against all kinds of things. Um, and they need to be immunized against the kind of disengagement and, and emotional problems that I think are part of this whole paradigm. Well, part of that parallel that I read into the book was the parallel of peer pressure, right? So it's trying to help our children understand, right? I'm yeah, there. so it's not just helping our children sort of cope with peer pressure, but it's the reality that a lot of what drives parental behavior is actually peer pressure. Right. So um, I think it's interesting because parents are, you know, what are they most worried about? They're most worried about peer pressure in adolescence with their kids, you know, like if everybody jumped off the bridge, would you? And yet their kids are constantly feeding back to me um, that their parents are particularly vulnerable to peer pressure. And I, I, I have a funny experience where um, my, local, my local little place, little grocery store, I had this fancy little grocery store, and after we dropped our kids off at school, all the moms would go there, you know, for our lattes, apparently. Mothers in Marin like being as stereotypical as possible. So we would all go for a latte, and I would go too, and I would just kind of stand and listen to the conversation, which was all about how extraordinary everybody was, and their children were great, and they didn't know which Ivy League school to go to, and there was no fighting in the house. And it, you know, and it was like, you got to be kidding, because I'm seeing half of those children, and they're not fine. Um, but the, I think that in, particularly in affluent communities, that any sign of vulnerability is seen as a sign of weakness. So if you say your kid's not doing well, you know, that you don't do that because it's a sign of weakness. It means you're not as good a mother as you should be. And so there is the very thing that I think women in particular need to get through the childbearing, raising years, which is a sense of compassionate community, is missing. And if well, you look Yesterday, I'm sorry, yesterday I was just kind of walking around looking at the um, bumper stickers on cars in my neighborhood. Um, and, and I have kids, I have one kid who went to a prestigious school and one kid who went to a good school and one kid who went to a very non-competitive school. And so I had all three of those bumper stickers on the back of my car because I think there is some sense of community. But as I look around the neighborhood, if it's not Cornell or Brown or Yale or Harvard, 
it's not on the bumper sticker. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of the way it is in a community like this, that you, you, do, you don't risk showing the vulnerability of having a, quote, average child. I was scheduled to give a talk many years ago on the average child in Marin County, and I can pack an audience pretty well, and I had absolutely nobody show up. So apparently there is not a single average child in the entire county. <laughs> this is so interesting to me because I, I want to make a, I want to posit something and I want to get your reaction to it. Sure. So this difficulty that the adults are having in kind of managing their own peer pressures and then re this unhealthy reliance on their own children for status and meaning and the inability to think past these things to deeper core values in the, in the long view of what they want for their children. Is it possible that we're in a little bit of a catch-22, that our schooling doesn't do a good job of supporting that kind of independent thinking? So parents grow up and they're not good at independent thinking, and so then they sort of conform to expectations. Have we gotten ourselves caught in a larger cultural trap? Uh, a larger cultural trap in terms of a lack of critical thinking and an emphasis on materialism and competition and that kind of thing? Is that Yes, question? and I was kind of going to going to springboard and give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about sort of the history, especially the era of narcissism and sort of how you've, um, maybe what you think the larger cultural trends have been. Yeah, I, you know, I th partly I think that there is tremendous isolation in this country, just tremendous isolation. And I, my husband does third world medicine, and when I go with him down to Guatemala, which is where he's in the jungle, it's absolutely dirt poor. But um, every morning, all the moms are out, you know, sort of together, washing their clothes at the river and talking about their kids. And I grew up in a very working class community. Um, you know, you didn't have to make a play date. You didn't have to make a date for yourself to see somebody. Doors were open and people had to help each other out because we didn't have the luxury of money. Uh, so you actually had to make a lasagna if somebody was sick next door instead of having somebody else make it for you or buying it. So I think I think there's a tremendous amount of isolation. I think the baby boomer generation grew up with the notion that, you know, it was like, uh, you do your thing. Remember Fritz Perl, you do your thing. Uh, I do my thing. I'm not in the world to live up to you. You're not in the world to live up to me. I, I think all that's off track, and that was certainly – part of the culture, you know, the 60s and 70s culture that, that I participated in, but it has lingered in a way that doesn't translate into adulthood. So while, you know, I'll leave it to somebody else to comment on it as a, as a way of being a, high, a college student, it, I don't think it was so damaging, but I think it left us with the notion that we were incredibly special and different and we weren't going to take the long view of anything. And I think one of the biggest problems with parenting is parents aren't taking the long view. You know, they're, they're looking at the quarter or the grade at the end of the semester. And, you know, I can tell you, having kids grown up now, you don't want to be doing that. You want to be thinking about your kid at 25 or at 30 when they get married and they have their own children and they become contributing members. So I think we were, we were very short-sighted. Um, very narcissistic, uh, and then you had the self-esteem movement, which came in um, and said everybody is incredibly special, and they totally missed what special means in terms of child development, because self-esteem actually is a protective factor for children. We want our children to have self-esteem, but not the kind of self-esteem that was popularized kind of in the 80s, which was, I was, <laughs> I was in a uh, preschool the other day, and I'm watching this mom walk into the preschool with her, I don't know, four-year-old. And they're walking across the floor, and the mom's like six inches behind the kid, and she's like clapping her hand that he's walking. Yeah, you yeah, good job. And it's like, what? It's a good job of what? The kid is, he's four. He's supposed to be walking across the, the room. And then he hangs his coat up, you know, on the hook where his name is in big letters. And it's, good job, James. And it's like, no, that's not what. 
self-esteem is about. Self-esteem is not about doing what you're supposed to do or you're expected to do. Self-esteem grows out of competence, so you have to work hard at something, and then out of competence comes confidence. But the self-esteem movement sort of um, neglected all of that and jumped right to this notion that every child should feel really great about everything they do. You know, this is when my kids were growing up, everybody got a trophy so nobody would feel badly. And it, it completely missed the, you know, the developmental aspect of kids have different things that they need to accomplish at different developmental stages. Young kids have to learn self-control so they can go to kindergarten and not hit anybody. And then you have to learn how to make friends. And then you have to learn to be interested in stuff. And then you have to learn how to be intimate. I mean, there's, there's just a whole bunch of things that kids have to learn how to do um, in a reasonably predictable sequence. And instead of us as parents being able to tolerate the mistakes in that, the falling down in that, the lack of confidence, and, the, and uh, then allowing the child to get up and do it themselves again and again and again until they get it right, we come in too early, we think, you know, it's a bad reflection on us, and we want our kids to look good because it means we've done a good job. And it's absolutely, frankly, ass backwards. We do a good job when our kids actually can fall down and get up again, not when we're constantly holding them So up. it takes a fair amount of emotional maturity to have that long view as a parent. It seems like it takes even more emotional maturity to adopt your strategy of establishing your own interests separate from your children. I mean, even my wife and I have been married 25 years and have read many parenting books and participated in all these good discussions. You know, I told her the laundry story that you tell in the book and then the Saturday soccer. Yeah. And, and I'm not even right. sure we really agree. Like, what's the appropriate balance for spending time involved in your children's activities versus spending time doing things independently so they see that you have a life and are independent or, and are personally satisfied. Uh, how do you get to that place of emotional maturity? And, and if, could we even think of that in the context of teachers and the emotional maturity to be supportive of their own interests in that same way? Yeah, I, th I think so. And, you know, let me start by saying, look, it depends on the age of your children. And it depends on the kind of children you have. So given that as a caveat, right, you're, you're obviously much more involved and need to be with um, a four-year-old than you need to be with an 11-year-old. Their, you know, their need for protection, and you don't take your eyes off the four-year-old when they're young because the world's a dangerous place. But it's not as dangerous as people act now. I, I just I saw Dan Pink was on your list of people who have spoken, and I just spoke recently with Dan Pink, and we did this thing about at what age would you let your child roam freely around the neighborhood, you know? And I'm so naive. I started asking people how many, you know, raise your hand if you would allow them to go around the neighborhood at 8. Well, nobody raised their hand at 8 or 9 or 10 or 11. And then at 12, we got... 11, 12, 13, we got people saying, yeah, I would let my kid take their bike around the neighborhood at 13. And, um, you know, the average age of uh, sexual intercourse in this country is 16. So it strikes me as bad judgment to only allow three years between letting your kid ride around the bike and putting on a condom. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that kids need to learn. And they need to learn it by experiencing it, experimenting with it, and our anxiety when parents say to me, you know, it's such a dangerous world when, in fact, of course, it's much less dangerous than it was when I was growing up, or, or even you, by the little picture I have in front of me, it's much less dangerous, it's much less violent, but we've got a 24-hour news cycle that makes us feel like it, it is. Uh, dangerous and and so you know we're sort of robbing kids of the ability to to master the appropriate developmental tasks at the right age. That being said, you know that every kid is different. How do you find the balance between your needs and your child? I would say that the aside from 
Um, I'm only as good as my last performance. The second most common phrase in my office is, please help my mother get a hobby besides me. And I don't think that's just, you know, the standard adolescent get my parents off my back. I think, which it is partly, but I think it's also um, my, my mother, it's usually my mother, my mother's involvement in my life is so deep and so intense um, that one, it's kind of suffocating me, and two, growing up looks really unappealing. I mean, you know, that, that's the joke about sitting in the bleachers is, you know, you spend all week working your butt off, and then your kid sees you all weekend long participating in children's activities. And um, one of my patients here today was just talking about her late 20s kids who just won't grow up. You know, they're just sitting around, laying on the couch, playing video games, and this is not an uncommon uh, presentation in the office. And And I think part of it is, Adulthood just doesn't look that interesting. You know, if you remember um, when you were 12, how exciting it was that you were going to be 13 soon, right? Because you were going to be a teenager. It was something to look forward to. Or when you were 15 and you were going to be 16 and get a driver's license, like that was incredibly cool. But I think many kids now take a look. They see their parents exhausted. Um, tied to technology in ways that preclude real relationships in the family, and then spending their time, um, you know, arguing with the coach about a blown call or something. I think that's a very unattractive looking view of adulthood to a lot of kids. You're right. There's no greater silver bullet for your child's happiness and adjustment than your own state of mind. I mean, I probably put 10 stars next to that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's true. I mean, there's the research side of it, there's the clinical side. You know, the research is if you're a depressed mom, the chances of you're having a child with emotional problems skyrockets. And it makes sense because the basic underpinning of emotional health that we can control, you know, and I, I want to put a caveat in there, which is when you talk about parent, when I talk about parenting, nobody knows exactly how much of a contribution parenting makes to a child's, you know, mental health, academic success, any of that. We don't know. We know that about 50% is genetic. That doesn't mean the other half is parents. There's parents, there's the culture, there's, you know, is your kid sitting next to the merit scholar or the local, you know, cocaine dealer. There's, lot, there's all kinds of things. So we don't know exactly what percentage of who we are impacts our children. But what we do know is it's the only thing we have real control over. So whether it's 5% or 45%, it's the part that we can control. And so the research is if you yourself are depressed or have a very conflicted marriage or substance abusing, the odds of your child having emotional problems skyrocket. Um, but I, I never like putting that out only in terms of the damage to the child because I, th I think this is one of the things that happens with women. It's as if it's not a good enough reason just to say, you know what, it's not good for you not to have a life that feels adult and fulfilling and interesting and keeps you growing. So, of course, we want to do anything that's protective of our children, but we're also entitled to have a satisfying life of our own. At the beginning of the book, there's the story you tell of Daniel who comes to visit you, and there's this um, emotional maturity to Daniel as a, I think he's a senior in high school, and he's thinking about colleges, and his dad sort of emotionally reacts to a specific school. And um, I read that story in two ways. One was sort of deeply impressed with Daniel's maturity, mm -hmm. and at the same time thinking, um, this is often hard for parents who, who, uh, to think that the child could actually be thoughtful and independent. And is some of this just about control? You know, um, I, li I like your point actually a lot, uh, Steve, that some parents just have trouble often thinking that their kids have capacities that, um, that they already possess. A child after about 13 has the same cognitive capacity as an adult does, 
which is really hard to believe because they don't have any judgment and they don't have any experience, but they are able to think in abstract ways, just like we do. So I think often, you know, Ned Hallowell uses the, uh, the, the Ferrari with, with bicycle brakes. Um, you know, the, the, the impulsive part of them is way ahead of the uh, thoughtful part of them, but they can think they can think um, logically, they can think abstractly, and when they put their mind to it, you know, they're, they're reasonably good at thinking through a problem. I think that the, in that story, just like in every story like that, uh, there's a backstory. And the backstory there was that dad was one of four children. Three of them went to Harvard, and he didn't get in. So... By God, his kid was going to make up that narcissistic injury for him by getting in. And that would sort of take the cloud that had hung over him his whole life. And I think we all have things like this. We often when I talk to parents, I'll, you know, I'll talk about those moments when we all sound crazy. Uh, maybe you don't, but most of us do. <laughs> I'll assume you have from time to time. And that there are times when we, just like the dad jumping off and going, you know, I give my testicle to get my kid in, um, we all have times where we sounded crazy. And I'll often tell the story of my, my youngest son who had the hardest time in school. He was a total hands-on learner, which is not what schools love. And he was an average child. He graduated exactly in the middle of his graduating class. And um, he had a little bit of a language learning disability, and he um, went into his final in English, which was his most problematic subject, with an A minus. And I did everything wrong. You know, I told him that he was really smart. And um, anyway, he takes his final, and he gets a B plus in the course, which actually for him was a very good grade. And I go crazy. I, I do everything wrong. I yell at him. I knew it. You're a slacker. You just can't, you know, you're just never going to ace anything. He's crying. I'm crying. It's just one of those off-the-rails things. So I get myself out of the room because I know I'm close with my kids. I know I'm blowing a good relationship. I don't know what I'm doing. But I decided that I had to think about it. My first impulse, you know, is I'm going to call Harper Collins and, and William Morris and tell them to get the book because who am I to tell anybody how to raise a child? I can't even raise my own. Um, but we all make mistakes. All of us. And, um, you know, without going into my whole story, what I figured out about my father had died when I was that exact same age. And we had no money. We were on welfare. And the only way I got to go to college was on a scholarship because I had good verbal skills. So in that moment of kind of going off the rails with him, just like, you know, Daniel's father did, um, I wasn't seeing my kid at all. Um, my kid, thank God, had a father, and we had resources. I was just kind of back in a loss. It could be a disappointment. It could be a trauma from our history. And and um, I'm pretty compassionate, frankly, when parents do stupid things like that. One, because I think we all do it. Um, and two, because I think it usually comes out of a place of great pain in our own lives that hasn't hasn't been addressed. So not such a great thing to do to your kid. You get a chance to go back, rework it, apologize, but mostly you get to think again about the ways in which you're projecting your own issues onto your child. And that's never a good idea because it always involves distortion, just like it did with Daniel's father, just like it did with my son and I. Is there another dilemma here? Is there a little bit There's of a... There's a lot of other dilemmas. Yeah, I know there is. I, I know there is. But I want, to, I want to ask specifically about what may be a little bit of a parent-school relationship dilemma. Right? Uh -huh. If you assume that parents need to develop these skills and have the capacity to do so, but you often see children who are in struggling families, there's a tendency to sometimes want to take over the parental role from the school side, how do you keep this balance between a focus on parents and their role with their children and schools sometimes saying, well, if we don't do it, the, the parents won't do it for the child? Uh, that's a tough question. I, um, you always want to try and get the parents on board um, because they're the greatest 
influence in the kid's life. But that being said, I, you know, I, over the years I've seen plenty of instances where a teacher is an absolute lifesaver to a child. Um, I think we underestimate the importance of mentors in our kids' lives. Each one of my kids had um, a mentor of sorts, and, and they're still in touch with their those people. Um, and, you know, they, they had a good home life. Um, I think the, school, the school's effort is to try and collaborate with the parents. And I think most of the time that works. Uh, I think there are instances in which it doesn't work, and that's when having somebody at the school who really knows you and really cares about you makes a world of difference. So first, you know, first you try collaboration, and if that doesn't work, um, I'm not willing to give, you know, to give up on the kid because it feels like you're not supposed to sort of tread on the parent's um, choices about how to raise a child. I think, you know, a child who's suffering doesn't matter whether they're rich or poor or anything. Um, they need help. And um, again, to, you know, just because I've just come from a whole day of working, you know, there's an incident of uh, a kid being bullied and um, parents just not the adults just not stepping in. The parents just not stepping in. Well, then I'm going to get the school to step in. Somebody has to step in. Um, and I think, I think we, I actually think, and maybe this is controversial, but I think it used to be that adults as a whole did take responsibility for the community of children. And so my father was a cop, you know, and everybody in the neighborhood, you know, it was, it, it's, inconceivable now, but it was like, you know, if you don't shape up, buddy, you're going to go see Lou. Um, and uh, so he was part of the structure that kept kids, you know, in line. And and I, it's really disturbing to me when I'm down at the local market and we're all waiting at the deli counter and I hear, you know, some young boy talking about, you know, the sluts and the whores, and hoes, sluts and hoes. And the adults around not not saying anything. Um, I think I think we have a responsibility to our community. I think that about bullying in a very strong way. But I think that about you know just character in general. Um, that if more adults were you know look your kids don't like it. My kids will still they're all grown up. They'll still slump down in the car. If I'm coming up behind a kid at night without a helmet or a light because they know I'm going to stop and talk to that kid, um, but I think that's my responsibility, and I can almost guarantee you that they will do the same thing um, when they have their own children. There is a sense in the book of wanting to return to a certain set of values, and and my own father tells these stories of you know running through the neighborhood and have people yelling at him from the porch, correcting him. Right, and, and, and then, um, you know, I have stories in my own life of basically the bicycle was my freedom, but it's sort of s astonishing to my 15-year-old daughter that I actually had freedom, that I could ride around and wasn't due home. Um, so is there a time to return to? I mean, are there sort of substantially valuable things that have been lost, or is this always just a constant dilemma that there are different balances in different periods of times? Like if I point to the 50s or 60s, I can find positives and negatives. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think you have to be very careful not to romanticize the past, you know, like the 50s, leave it to beaver, that was not such a great time to be a child or a woman or a minority, you know, it was like a good time to be a, a white waspy guy. Um, and there were also good things, there were other good things and there were other bad things. And I think that's true, you know, of all times since Socrates wrote about that, you know. So it's nothing new to say things are problematic with young people or with parents. But I think that, I think that what kids are missing now, which is this basic kind of foundation, a sense of, you know, what I call a sense of self. Um, that's, that can be pretty irreparable um, in later life. And so it's not that um, 
I think that there's some bad behavior and it'll go away. You know, the studies on at least affluent kids, they started with kids in like the seventh grade and found that they had all these um, high rates of emotional problems. And we all thought, frankly, that that would end. You know, they'd get better. Like maybe they were having trouble for a while, but they'd get better. Um, and then we, we found that their rates of problems went up in the ninth grade. Uh, they had double the rates of depression as the general population. Well, we still thought they'll get better. And, th and then the 12th grade, they had tripled the rates of problems. So I, I, think, I think we sort of are too busy being almost like decorators with our children. You know, we've got the curtains on right, the right clothes. And, um, but we really need to be construction workers in a way. We need to be worried about the foundation and it's the foundational issues that I'm really concerned about. You know, and I think we actually get that with young children. So, um, for example, if, you know, if you have a toddler and that toddler takes a few steps and falls down and, you know, you go, come on, honey, get up again, and they take a few more steps and fall down. And, you know, we don't say to that child, you're going to be flipping burgers the rest of your life if you fall down again. We sort of know that the child has to fall down 10, 20, 30 times in order to become a competent walker. And I think we're missing that. We feel the stakes are too high uh, as our kids get older, and so we don't let them uh, make the mistakes that need to be made in order to develop, you know, a degree of resilience. You don't develop resilience. Dr. Spock said a million years ago, well, not a million years ago, when I was raising my kids, you know, if your child's never been bandaged, you're not doing a good job. And, you know, this is not out of, like, make sure your children have lots of trauma or failure, although the very best teacher my oldest son ever had, Ed Allen, if you're anywhere out there, Ed, um, my son, you know, the one who became a lawyer, did everything right all the time, and he transferred schools, and he hands in his first paper, perfect as always, and his teacher took a big red marker, made an X over it, and said, next time, make a mistake. And um, it did not change him in, uh, you know, substantively, but it made him aware that there were people out there who were just as interested in his taking chances um, in pushing himself than they were in him being perfect all the time. I thought it was a great lesson, something we still talk about. So, um, you know, my worry is not sort of this surface trivial worry about I'm the, the smoking the wrong dope or, you know, it, it's taking a little longer to grow up. I think it's a very basic issue of not having resilience. And whenever I speak, Steve, I ask my audience, you know, how many people in the audience have not faced a loss, a death, a separation, a financial reverse? And it's nobody. Everybody hits those tough things in life. And so will our children, as painful as it is to think about. And if they don't have a sense of self and some coping skills, they're in for a lot of trouble. The book has, in the back, uh, activities and exercises for parents and families. Right. Where have you seen communities or schools make progress in this area? Is there a particular way that you feel is valuable to approach this as a community? I do, actually. And one of the communities that that I like and I feel has worked really hard, there's a, a community on the north shore of Chicago. It's a very affluent area. Um, a gal named Lonnie Stanich after I came and spoke and Denise came and spoke and the schools were challenged success schools, they brought in the whole community, not just the teachers, not just the parents, but anybody who was interested. So, so the school janitor was there and the guy cutting meats behind the counter was there. And, I, and they worked as a group on what the community values were going to be and how they could implement them in their different roles. And I think that that's been useful. I think they've made some real changes. And I've taken their, that model that they developed and brought it to other places. It's Arinda, um, where, out where I live, is doing a, Lafayette is doing a really nice job. Their church is bringing in not just parents and teachers, but everybody who has um, contact with kids. And that, I, in a way, that goes back to an earlier question, which is, um, Parents may or may not do the best job we would like, but there's also a whole community around that can 
either, you know, reinforce what the parents are doing or, you know, make up for things that are still problematic for parents. We can kind of close uh, with this final question. And it's come up several times on the show. It feels like there's a moral imperative here, right? The way that we're treating students, that there's, the, there's a fairly small tent for success. And a, and a lot of kids feel like they're not in that tent. Is this a moment of real significance? And is there a moral imperative from your standpoint? Do we really need to change this? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, if, we, if we don't, you know, it's not just you've got educators saying this, you've got psychologists saying this, you've got the business community saying, I mean, probably a third of my speaking is to major corporations in this country. Why? Because they feel like the kids they're getting just aren't capable of doing the kind of work that needs to be done. So on the most pragmatic level, we don't have the resources for all this, the mental health needs. The uh, state of California is in a state of crisis at the, at the UCs because they can't meet mental health needs and the, and the uh, business community says the, we can't use these kids. They need too much uh, reinforcement and um, attention. So from every, you know, from every angle, it's not working. And I think, I think it is our job as adults to say that it is the need, that it's the next generation, you know, that has to be able to move forward. And if they're not able to move forward, you know, it's not just the joke of some kid coming home and laying on the sofa and playing video games and smoking dope. That's a real, that's a real issue. And nobody wants that for their children. So I think we have a, what you call a moral imperative to do some really deep thinking about how we attach ourselves to our children, whether or not it's the, the most useful way, and what we're doing to help them grow into, you know, I call it the 30-year plan. 30 years from now, is your child going to be a contributing member of society? And in order to do that, they have to have a whole skill set, and they have to have a really robust sense of who they are. Madeline, thank you so much. That was really delightful. That was fun. Madeline Levine on her book, Teach Your Children Well, Parenting for Authentic Success. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Madeline, for, for figuring out the audio on your computer. Ah, uh, thank you. Coming up next week, Matt Hearn on de-schooling and Elliot Washer and Charles, I'm not even going to try to say his last name, on <laughs> leaving to learn. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye.